Hey, Amy. Good afternoon. This is Audrey Russo, and welcome to Business as Usual. And uh, I, in a moment, I am going to introduce our guest. I'm Audrey, and I run the Tech Council. That's sort of how I like to say it. And with me is Jonathan Kirsting. He's Vice President of Visibility and All Things Media. He will be joining us to help us with our questions and navigate that. So thanks for today's call. Big shout out to Huntington Bank, our long-term partners, and people who believed us as we entered our 52nd show, I believe, over these last 12 weeks. And oh my been, goodness. I know, they have been with us right from the onset and they're one of the largest SBA lenders in the region and really helped a lot of small companies navigate you know, some of the federal stimulus that has occurred both the state and uh, federal level. So tomorrow is Wednesday, and we're excited to jo uh, be joined by CNX CEO Nick DeLulis and Ken Broadvent. He's the business manager of Steam Fitters Local 449. I'm very excited about that conversation. Thursday, we're going to talk with the URA to discuss loyalty bonds and new way to help entrepreneurs. So we've muted you, except for Mike. We've muted you, and uh, because we don't want to hear what's going on in the background. Because most of you are still, see, I just heard it. I just heard something in the background. And uh, we also have a chat. Just heard it. And the chat is to make sure that we have an opportunity to ask uh, questions. And the chat is not to be used for anything in terms of selling product. So on that note, appreciate everyone being here and to be joined by Speaker Mike Terzai of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. He is the Speaker of the House. So welcome, Mike. And I'm going to launch in and, and ask Andrew, how are you. That's okay. Thank you. It's great to see you. So right now, many Pennsylvanians are expressing their anger and sadness about what has occurred and has been occurring with the George Floyd and many inequities that exist across America. Last week, you described the officer's actions in that case as depraved and senseless. You also talked about the need to create renewed professionalism in our criminal justice system. So can you talk about the ways that you see the Commonwealth helping to eliminate some of the significant gaps and inequities that exist right here in our state? Yes, Audrey, yet an unnecessary tragedy that has to be addressed on many fronts, I think, across the nation. And um, here's what, what I, in my release that I had written, and I, I want to explain the details in the second paragraph. Um, in the first, I said the tragic incident uh, exposes the need for fairness in all aspects of our national life. And that's after I had said that, that the killing of, of George Floyd by a police officer was depraved and senseless, and that Americans need, you know, demand justice. Um, and, and I wanted to use the capital city of Harrisburg as an example. It's a city of about 30,000 uh, citizens, um, but, but I'm there a lot, right? And, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we have a, there's a Democratic mayor there, and I'm a Republican speaker, and he and I have worked together. We brought an authority uh, to provide some oversight, much like we did in, for Pittsburgh back in 2004. It was my bill. And it was designed to, how, how can we reinvigorate uh, Harrisburg and bring in um, jobs and opportunity and, and there's a significant minority population there and one of the things that he and i focused on a democratic mayor and a republican speaker was school choice we, we both uh, strongly supported educational choice we were actually trying to focus a harrisburg capital city approach it would have been a a, a prototype for the lack of a better phrase we also wanted to do more um state funding to emphasize community policing professional community policing. Uh, that's no aspersions on the, the good folks in the Harrisburg Police Department, but, but they need uh, increased funding, but they also needed increased uh, training and focused on, on what does it mean to be a, a part of the community as opposed to being just sort of, um, you know, a martial force for the lack of a better phrase. Um, and, uh, and I, and I think our final one is, is how do you get folks to invest in the city, uh, not just nonprofits, uh, by the way, because there are government buildings, of course, uh, but, but how do you get folks to invest in the city so that there are family sustaining jobs? 
and that families, uh, and there's some, you know, in all neighborhoods around Harrisburg feel like there's an opportunity to, to uh, in, a, in a very safe sense, raise their families there of all economic backgrounds to have opportunities for jobs, safe environments, and in addition, real opportunities from a school choice perspective. I, I will tell you this, we were spending, uh, I don't have the facts in front of me, but my, my memory is pretty good about the details, about 23,000 per student, uh, which is well above the, the state average and, and twi almost twice the national average of about 12,000 per student. Uh, the, the vast majority of that was picked up by um, your state tax dollars. That means other folks from across the state were infusing money, you know, through our budget mm -hmm. uh, to the Harrisburg School District. And I think that those component parts are so crucial to having some level of, of, of success in moving forward um, for everybody uh, of, of all races, backgrounds, creeds uh, in, a, in a particular city. I, I just, I used that in my second paragraph. I said at this critical time in the life of our state, the capital city of Harrisburg could offer a vision for change. A Democratic mayor and a Republican speaker standing together for educational choice and community policing and economic investments leading to family sustaining jobs. We can cross the partisan divide. We can stand together for what is right and we can heal broken communities. The moment calls for fear, not, or for hope, not fear, love, not hate. And, and I just think the more constructive you can be, the more tangible you can be, the better off you are. And it needs that kind of a discussion across, across the aisle. So last, last week, the governor signed a budget that the General Assembly had adopted earlier. This yes. was a bit of a different budget, though. Yes. Uh, you yes. know, it was only partial for the year. So can you talk about the major priorities? Because here we are in June. And yes. that was achieved in the budget. You know, it's so interesting. Um, in my tenure, approaching 20 years now, uh, my third term as speaker, second term as majority, or I had two terms as majority leader. This is my third term as speaker. And then I, I was a uh, minority whip uh, prior to being the majority leader. So I've, I've been in budget discussions for quite some time uh, over the course of Pennsylvania. The interesting thing about Pennsylvania is, is we're not Illinois, California, New York, New Jersey, all with significant debt loads, mm -hmm. uh, both in terms of their pensions, both in terms of their unemployment compensation um, and, and their general obligation debt. And in addition, we have a more reasonable tax base and we have grown uh, as the economy has grown. But since the recession of 2008, uh, which was a, I mean, a real recession, the Obama stimulus package kind of um, propped up state spending for two years, uh, the last two years of Governor Rendell's term. The, the Obama stimulus package was really not about infrastructure, it was about propping up educational spends right. and service spends for state governments all across the country. So it got us through those two years, but we, we never really saw an uptick in growth in the economy. From 1819 going into 1920, was the most significant growth I've seen in my career, and I think in a lifetime, really. Uh, our uh, corporate aid income tax was up 18% without increasing rates. Our sales taxes were up about 8%, and our personal income taxes were up about 6%. We put some money in rainy day funds. We increased spending across the board. Um, it was the, the highest growth in an economy any of us had seen ever. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it allowed, uh, it, it really was two fronts, I think. it was sort of the, the regulatory reform and the tax, uh, the corporate and, and personal tax changes on a federal level. But it was also because we had just been responsible for the better part of um, really since, I, I would say since uh, 2011, 2012, we, 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 our, our investments in the teachers' pensions, which were significantly in debt, have increased by over 800%. Since 2011-12, we continually just up the the such that it was, I think, about in this past budget, and then I'll talk about the budget we just voted on. Uh, it was at it it almost five billion dollars annually in state and local tax dollars. Our our contribution about 2.6 billion. We've been at the actuarially required contribution for I think this is the the third. This will be the fourth budget, believe it or not. Hmm. Uh, and in addition, we had we had 
made sure that the unemployment compensation fund, which when Corbett took over was at an eight year, we continued to build it up over, over these uh, since 2010, 2011, and we passed balanced budgets. And, um, and we're not like the federal government, we don't get the print. So we go in and we are expecting for 1920, the budget we're in to be with some significant growth still, Right. We're expecting to be in the black by a billion, a billion and a half. Um, and we were in the black significantly more in, in the last one. Um, and then, of course, there's COVID-19. And then we have the collapse of the economy. Um, almost 2 million Pennsylvanians right now have filed for unemployment compensation. We're about 1.96. And then another, um, and let me just see, I just want to look at the pandemic as unemployment assistance figure. Those are, that's um, self-employed and contractors, gig workers. Mm -hmm. That number stands as of today at 450,000 claims. Think about that. 450,000 claims for pandemic unemployment assistance and almost 2 million unemployment compensation. So that's about 2.5 yeah, million of our citizens who are out of work. Um, what we have right now is, um, is uh, an economic collapse and our budgets we projected for 1920 are about 4 billion short the budget we're in. Now we go to the next budget and it's hard to like, we, we, we really can't predict um, a, with, you know, is this going to be a V-shaped recovery as we move into, you know, the, 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 this next phase of, phase of living with COVID-19. But what we did is, is we, we, we were at a $34 billion budget. Um, that, that's not our motor vehicle side of the budget. That's a separate fund. That's about seven, about seven billion separately. Uh, but about a $34 billion budget. And we were looking, our projections for uh, 2021 is about, um, uh, about 26 billion. About, so it's really a three, quarter, a three quarter budget that we passed. And here's how we approached it. We, we can wait and wait and wait, and nobody has any level of predictability or stability. Um, typically, we have the budget done by June 30th. I know there have been some protracted uh, battles on that, but the, the goal was we had to provide some level of predictability and stability. So what we did, and this, I, I, I did, I, did uh, I was the impetus to getting this done at, on the timetable that we did for all of us. I just gathered up my leaders. I said, we should have this done by the end of May mm -hmm. uh, so that people have some, some sense. We got our colleagues in the Senate, the Senate Republicans on board. We debated for the rest of the expenditures, do we do a five month or a seven month? Uh, the Senate Republican leaders wanted to do a five month. The governor started to discuss with the governor and his team. He was on board as were his uh, inner circle. And, um, and, and as you know, um, three out of the four caucuses were in support, the Senate Republicans, Senate Democrats, House Republicans, and the governor. The House Democrats were not on board. They were the only caucus not on board, but everybody else was. And uh, we had the votes. So we did two things. We, we fully funded for the year, for the whole year to provide the predictability and stability. We fully funded K through 12 education and we fully funded state-related Pitt, Penn State, Temple, Lincoln, the state system, your Slippery Rock, California, Edinburgh, IUP, uh, West. And we fully funded the scholarships or grants and loans, um, which many, the FIA loans and, and grants, which many of our students at the independent universities and colleges in our state make use of. The students at our state system and state-related make use of those too, by the way. Mm -hmm. So all of that got funded. Then for the others, we did in a range of five to six months to see where we stand uh, really at the end of November. And, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll see what kind of recovery it is. We'll see if there's federal money for filling up your coffers. The second component was this. The federal COVID money came in, in really different tranches, but the CARES Act itself was $4.9 billion. We were not allowed, according to when we talked to federal legislators, um, we were not allowed to use that money to backfill our budget like Rendell got to use the Obama stimulus plan. We didn't get to do that. So 
of that 4.9 billion, 1 billion went to seven counties, including 212 million to Allegheny. We did not have any say in how those were expended. Those were sent to the seven most populous counties in the state, um, Philadelphia and Allegheny being the two largest. And so what we did is, is we spent all but 1.2 billion of the 3.9 my bill, the Senior Protection Act, developed with UPMC, also Allegheny Health Network's a part of the, the availability to provide for testing and surveillance, infection control, and um, clinical on the boots uh, practicing uh, nurses, practitioners coming from the, the teaching hospitals into the nursing home facilities across the state um, in the end, I think we, we spent on the nursing homes and personal care homes and assisted living residents of that um, 3.9 billion, uh, I, th I think it's around 750 million, 700, maybe it's around 700, 700 million, I think it is, just, just shy of that. We did have uh, 20 million, I was hoping to get up to 25 million for our cultural institutions, mm -hmm. we have a program that's going to go to the Commonwealth Financing Authority. Um, my team had been working with folks from the Philadelphia and the Pittsburgh cultural institutions. They're devastated. They don't have income. They, they don't have, um, they've laid off employees. Who knows when they can get back to work and, and provide for the soul and spirit of our citizenry. But there's 20 million that's gonna to go to the Commonwealth Finance Authority. And I think the grants can be up to 500,000. Those are for our cultural institutions, which yes. are yes. so plenty here in our region. I was hoping to get a little bit more in there, but, but there's a possibility mm -hmm. that by November we can. Okay. So yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna dive in a little bit about the nursing homes it, and uh, in our show and in a lot of the work I've been trying to raise the, the issues that, you know, in, in our county early on, 73% of the people who are passing away from COVID related deaths were in communal environments, both nursing homes and long-term care and personal care facilities. So uh, I applaud that we came to the rescue on that. Um, I, I'm sad that we all collectively did not address that early on. And our- You know, it's, it's, it's interesting, Audrey, of the 5,667 folks, and I, I, I didn't, I, I, I was hoping to get the updated average age, but I, Yes, uh, no, I have that, sir. Thank you. The average age, I think, uh, the last I had checked was 79. Right. Um, and we have, of the 5,667, uh, 3,597 uh, were in these senior settings, nursing homes, personal care homes, right. assisted okay. living residents. Also, um, you know, 90% of those that have passed away had, had at least one comorbidity, at least one. Well, Hypertension. Uh, right, pulmonary, right. Mm -hmm. uh, heart, uh, diabetes. Uh, those, those were, I think, the four most significant underlying uh, comorbidities. Uh, but, but this Senior uh, Protection Act, let me tell you, I talked to the folks at, at UPMC, and I talked to the folks at Temple and Penn State Health mm -hmm. and Penn and AHN, Allegheny Health Network. You know, many of these folks were, were like on the front line trying to help out. The nursing homes, personal care homes, assisting living residents, they are not equipped. They're just not equipped. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the teaching hospitals, we are so blessed in this state to have these teaching hospitals, these academic medical centers, that's a layperson term. But, you know, uh, the virologists, pathologists, infectious disease, and their nursing staff has these master's degrees in these areas. And they deal with infection control every day, right? As part of their existence. They, 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 their capability, UPMC has its toe in senior communities. I, I didn't check, uh, this was as of last Friday. I have not checked this week. They had not had one COVID related case, let alone death in their 32 senior communities. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we could talk about that, you know, a lot. And I appreciate the work that's been done now, right? Um, it just seemed like at the early onset, we didn't get the leadership from the governor to make some determination. So I applaud all those leadership now that have come in and helped and are helping.
And I like others. Uh, yeah, Dr. Gladwin, Dr. Nace, Deborah Brodine, mm-hmm. all from UPMC, uh, Dr. Yilly, just, and, and, and if you talk to the experts at any of those academic health centers, mm-hmm. they're all on top of it. So let's, let's switch, and I don't know if there's a question in there. I want to talk about, um, okay, I think there's some that's just upset about what's happening here. Yeah. We can, we can, we can get to that in a minute. Um, I want to talk about, like, we're going into green, okay? We're going into green now. And, right. you know, families are, have really endured a lot. And, you know, the unknown is, is still remains high because there's a lot of compliance issues as it relates to green. It's not like we're green and it's a free for all. So we're looking at next school year. We're listening to parents think about their summer plans. You know, some, there's camps, there's community pools, there's ultimately, you know, the start of the school year. What's going to go on? What do you, where, from where you are leading this, what, what do you see? Well, you know, early the Secretary of Education, Rivera, had, had intimated that, that the schools were not going to go back. And I, I had written a letter on May 2nd that that was unacceptable and that we needed a can-do approach, not a can't-do approach. He was going to have a call with us as legislator, legislators, mostly the legislative leaders, yesterday, but it got canceled and, and it's rescheduled for tomorrow. Um, I believe... Uh, we don't, I don't think we have a time yet for that, that, that call, but certainly I'll be on it. But I do think that um, based on you know, some of the items that I wrote, uh, it, it certainly made a difference because within, an, in, within two, two weeks, he, he had reversed course. Um, I, I had just said, uh, um, amongst others, that um, you know, administrators, teachers, staff are all being fully paid, everybody's being paid. Um, all medical benefits are covered, and it's uh, an investment of thirty-three million dollars between state and local taxes. The state gives the local school districts the power to enact those taxes, um, and uh, we're we're the second highest out of average teacher salaries in fifty states, and we're third out of pro rata spending on students out of fifty states. And I just said, we need to open the schools safely in the fall and Pennsylvania families and, and students really deserve nothing less. There will have been six months to plan a return to school and you can't restart an economy with, with kids not being back in school. Now, how about those that have, and, and it's a minority, a very small minority of students that have underlying medical issues. It, it's no different than what we, we would require right now under state law, um, the Department of Education the intermediate units, we have the Allegheny Intermediate Unit. I think it covers 42 school districts. I, I, I'm close to the number if I'm not exact. And the school districts have to create individualized education programs for every student that has an underlying medical um, issue. You, got, you have to, it's the law, you've got to develop it. And if, if uh, a component part of that is cyber charter school, um, there are three options for cyber charter. Uh, there's existing cyber charters. I think there's 14 of them in the state. Um, in addition, intermediate units are more than capable of developing a cyber charter. And school districts, many school districts are capable of, um, of developing such a cyber charter. Uh, that's, that's the approach. Um, I have a letter. Now, this goes to higher ed. I have talked to the chancellor at the University of Pittsburgh. I've talked to Dr. Engler, you know, Chancellor Gallagher at Pitt. Dr. Angler um, at Temple, President Barron at, at Penn State, all of them, uh, Amy Gutman, uh, President Amy Gutman at, at Penn, all, all of them intend to uh, be back into session uh, by the fall. And some of them are contemplating a second part of the summer, uh, some session, and uh, who, who better to figure that out than, you know, than these high level you know, academic institutions and as you've seen, Robert Morris, I think, was a great, great school in our region, Morris University, and then Grove City College. I think we're probably one and two in announcing that they were going to return to uh, to school in the fall. Um, there's a letter. Uh, my alma mater is not in Pennsylvania. My my alma mater is uh, Notre Dame, uh, but. Um, I'm going to find this letter from Dr. This op-ed by uh, mm-hmm. Father Jenkins. I, I just think this is such a important um, 
point, he said, our decision to return to on-campus classes for the small fall, fall semester was guided by three principles that arise from our core university goals. We strive to protect the health of our students, faculty, staff, and their loved ones. Second, we endeavor to offer an education of the whole person, body, mind, and spirit, and we believe that residential life and personal interactions with faculty members and among students are critical to such an education. And finally, we seek to advance human understanding through research, scholarship, and creative expression. He said, um, if it were just number one, they probably wouldn't reopen. He said, but if we took that course, we would risk failing to provide the next generation of leaders the education they need and to do the research and scholarship so valuable to, so to society. No science, simply a silent science can answer the question. It is a moral question in which principles to which we are committed are intention. Um, and then he says, we're, we, yes, certainly we're imposing risks, um, but, but we take risks all the time and that Notre Dame is going to be upfront in dealing with those. The question is, what risks are acceptable and why? And, um, and they have determined that it is worth the risk um, to educate young people. I, I think that's where we are. We have seen the data uh, that young people do not have the same level of exposure and uh, each of these schools has to take the appropriate steps. So, so we, we only have a few minutes and there are like a few questions. One is in relationship, I don't know if you can speak to this, but it's in terms of contact tracing. Yes. And, you know, we moved into green, you know, and we've been steady here in Allegheny County and actually declining and never really had a, a huge hotspot here outside of the nursing homes. So they're actually, someone's asking about, well, now what? You know, now that we're in green. And yeah. what yes. I, well, Friday is, is green here uh, in, in Allegheny County. But the key is, is on the contact tracing. The Department of Health has very explicit uh, guidelines. It's not, they're not even guidelines, they're directives. And uh, Secretary Levine has put those into place right. and yeah. uh, is, is very articulate in, uh, in describing exactly what the protocol is supposed to be. And mm -hmm. I, would, I would just tell everybody, turn to the Department of Health guidelines. Look, uh, and I would just say this, um, at, at the front end of this, the governor and uh, the secretary and, and the entire cabinet and legislature had uh, a, real, a real crisis in front of it. And we had to make sure that we got personal protection equipment to uh, health systems. We had to find ways to manufacture them. When we were first spending about 50 million and we were talking to the people at the health system, the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania, which was contracted to, to go find PPE for the state. I mean, they were following chains. I'm not being disrespectful. This is just it. They were going to brokers who were getting it from China. And everybody said, we've got to find a way to manufacture a good number of these here. And now you've got many manufacturers. I, I think it's over 75 that are manufacturing much of the PPE. And the testing is being really developed at, at the university academic centers. Pitt has done it, Temple's done it. Temple says they can do about 5,000 a day. The, the most important thing that they need is reagent. You know, uh, mm -hmm. um, contact tracing, I would look to the Department of Health and I would adhere to it. It's very specific. Yeah, I, th I think, uh, you know, Mike, we've taken, speaker, we've taken much of your time and I really appreciate that. These are hard times. These are when you take what's happened with, um, you know, unemployment, people aren't getting their unemployment, even though it's been processed. They've submitted claims back in March. We're still seeing people who are waiting, you know, for some sort of relief. We um, are living obviously in this pandemic and, you know, much of our economy has, has, has tremendously suffered as everyone knows. And the nursing home situation, et cetera, is what we need is confidence. And um, I thank you for taking the time with us to talk about the budget, to talk about the issues that affect us. I know there are still more questions, but I'm trying to be sensitive to time at, at this being 1230. I do know that your office has an email and there's lots of ways for people to get their information and their questions directly to you. You're always more than gracious with that. So at one o'clock, I thank you, speaker. Um, be, continue to be safe. Audrey, you too. And, and boy, you have a you always have a great lineup, but to have Nick and uh, Ken tomorrow, yeah. Ken, mm -hmm. Ken Broadbent and, right. uh, 
and um, Nick uh, Diolis, uh, right. welcome to them both. Please get yeah, my desk. It's, yeah, it's great. And we also have um, the chancellor joining us from Pitt next week. And, you know, we're continuing to try to make sure that we're having these important conversations, that there are pathways for communication and that people are engaged and we're able to ask questions. So for those of you who didn't get a chance to have either Jonathan or I ask the questions that you can send them right to his office. We can put his email, you know, his website contact up there, which is great. Thank you for being accessible. I know these are tough times. This is um, a time where we are taking our moment to make sure that we understand what's happened in the world as we see riots right in our own backyard and the issues that are facing black Americans as matters to us in the tech community. Audrey, so, and, and, and let me just say, you know, many legislative offices just shut down. Uh, they all shut down. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, two employees in our district office and nonstop phone calls right. on unemployment compensation, pandemic right. unemployment, on the mm -hmm. waivers. Literally, I, I will say at one point, um, my, we're godparents uh, to mm -hmm. Sarah and Brian's uh, oldest and, uh, right. and, and they're close with their family. Literally at one point, Sarah just said the sad and tragic uh, stories in people's personal lives from losing their small businesses, mm -hmm. from losing their jobs, and uh, people trying to get through the phone lines, which they couldn't, uh, to the governor's office for unemployment compensation right. or pandemic insurance. We continue to be the point persons, and we were one of the few offices across the state that never shut down. Right. So that's why I'm encouraging everyone who's remaining on this call to reach out to Speaker Terzai's office, and you will get the help. Just be patient. And I know there's questions about unemployment. I know there's questions about, um, you know, what we're doing in matters of um, crime, is matters of pride, you know, in matters of making sure that our community gets back on our feet. And, uh, you know, Pittsburgh has grit. That's why I continue to have adopted this place. And against all odds, I think we are going to move forward, but it's not going to be easy. So thank you for your leadership. Stay tuned. If you, There's a link on our chat that at one o'clock, we're actually doing our STEM, our virtual STEM summit. And today we have the general manager of thank Facebook you everybody. Labs. Thanks, Mike. Thanks. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you, everybody. Take care.